So we said you need a susceptible host, you need the right type of bacteria, and we also mentioned you need a food source. So diet is a huge factor when it comes to developing caries. Now, specifically, things in your diet such as fermentable carbohydrates, right? Carbohydrates that are capable of being broken down into smaller subunits. Those type of carbohydrates are notorious for causing, a, you know, basically causing caries because they are a food source for that specific type of cariogenic bacteria. So bacteria feed on the carbohydrates, they use it as a food source, and they produce lactic acid as a byproduct. That acid lowers the pH content in the mouth, thereby removing minerals from the tooth. Now, you know, this isn't just sugar from candy or from soda. This can be carbohydrates from any food source. Now, we're going to go into a little bit more here in a second. It's not necessarily what you eat, it's how often you eat it. All right, so for this next part of this discussion on diet, I want to look specifically at this graph that I included in your handout. Now, there's a classic study, and this graph is what's called the Stefan graph, or the Stefan curve, right? I've heard some people call it Stephen. I call it Stefan because I like to get fancy. So if you look at this, it's very interesting some of the things that this graph actually shows. So this is two parts. You have the top part which shows you know, the pH on one side and then how many minutes after a patient's exposed to glucose on the other. Now, it's generally agreed that a pH of 5.5 is considered the threshold or the critical pH for enamel to have demineralization. So if you expose a patient to a glucose rinse, so you're exposing them to a fermentable carbohydrate source, what's going to happen is they're going to have an immediate drop in their pH. It's going to go from, in a caries-free individual, the green line, it's going to go from a little bit above 7 and then it's going to dip down a little bit below 6. And what you see is it doesn't ever go below that critical 5.5 pH, right? So a caries-free person is not really losing a lot of minerals from their teeth because they're starting at a higher pH and then when they are exposed to those carbohydrates, yes, they're still getting you know, bacteria that's feeding off of that, they're still getting acid production, but it's never producing it to a large amount. It's not producing it to the point to where it's gonna lower that pH so severely below that critical pH of 5.5. Now, if you compare that to somebody who has caries potential, they're not necessarily high caries risk, but they are at risk for getting caries. They've had a, one or two cavities in the past that's been treated. So you know they're going to get it in the right circumstances. So that would be like the blue line or this kind of purple line. And what you see is, is their pH starts a little bit below the person who doesn't have caries. right? So their resting pH is a little bit lower, right below 7. They are exposed to the glucose. And look, their pH drops below 5.5 all the way to the 5 pH mark. And then it slowly kind of comes back up above that threshold. So in these patients, when they're exposed to glucose, they're going to have demineralization occur. Now, the key factor for these patients is think about the scale again. They have to have more protective factors than pathologic factors present. So if they're constantly being exposed to glucose over and over throughout the day, they're going to have demineralization occur they don't want that to exceed remineralization of the tooth. Last, on the top graph, let's look at the red line. This is somebody that's extremely high caries risk. This is that patient that comes into your office and they have a cavity almost every tooth in their mouth, right? There's just tons and tons of cavities. You count them up, it's like 8, 10, 12 plus cavities. This person starts out at a resting pH of almost 5.5, extremely low. They have so much bacteria in their mouth producing acid on a regular basis, 
that they can't ever get to a higher pH, right? Their resting pH is always gonna be lower. So now they're already in a resting pH that allows demineralization to actually occur. They're exposed to a glucose source and their pH drops dramatically, you know, down to like 4.5. And look how long it takes for that to come back up. I mean, according to this graph, even at 60 minutes after they're exposed to that glucose source, they're still not up to that 5.5 mark. So that really should put it in perspective that if you have a patient that has a lot of caries or a lot of cavities present in the mouth, these types of patients are gonna be fighting an uphill battle. They're gonna have an extremely hard time turning things around without the right interventions from you and the right you know, help from themselves because they have to help themselves in this situation. There's a lot of things that have to change. All right, next, if we look at this graph on the bottom portion, the frequency of that sugar exposure for that cariogenic plaque is going to greatly influence the progress of that demineralization. All right, so the top line actually illustrates a pH depression in somebody that's like eating three meals a day, right? So they have a morning, a noon, and an evening meal. And what happens is they go from a resting pH, the pH drops down a little bit, it does go below the 5.5 mark, and then it comes back up. So if you're looking at this, this person actually spends the majority of their day their, where their oral environment, their mouth is actually at a pH that's a little bit higher than that demineralized critical pH of 5.5. Now compare that to somebody who's frequently snacking throughout the day. All right, the second line. This is somebody that's constantly exposing themselves to frequent exposure to carbohydrates, right? This could be somebody that's sipping on the soda, the Coca-Cola all day long, you know, taking a, a swig of this every five minutes. This could be somebody that's snacking constantly throughout the day. So what's happening is they're constantly having these dips where they go below the 5.5 and they come back up and they go down and back up, down and back up. They're never really allowing their mouth to be at a higher pH. So their scale now is being tipped more towards demineralization as opposed to having remineralization of the teeth. So diet is so important in that caries process that you really should think about doing a dietary analysis on your patients. Now, when I talk about this, we're kind of dipping into a little bit about treatment, but you need to understand what the patient's diet is like. You need to understand how frequent they're exposing themselves to fermentable carbohydrates or sugar in their diet. And sometimes you have to think about too, like, dietary patterns throughout the week. If I do a dietary analysis on a patient, I'm typically going to do a couple of days through the week and I'm going to do a day or two on the weekend because you can guarantee that my diet is going to change on the weekend. It's not going to be the same as it is through the week because on the weekend I'm at home. I'm sitting around all day. I'm bored sometimes. I'm looking for things to do and I snack more and I eat more and I drink more. Whereas through the work week, I'm actually busy, I'm occupied, so I'm not really, I don't really have the time to sit and snack or to eat. So patients are gonna be no different. They're gonna have different patterns in their eating and in their diet.